Hello everyone, my name is Bella Martinez, and today I'm going to be speaking to you about climate change and traditional ecological knowledge, cultural and subsistence activities in Alaska Native communities within the context of a changing climate. Climate change is the crisis of our age, um, here defined as long-term shifts in temperature, new weather patterns, and disrupted resources caused by anthropogenic forces. Um, it is not something new. We have been undergoing climate change for a long, long time, but this specific climate change we're referring to of the 21st century um, is due to industrialization and anthropogenic forces. Um, Freeze-thaw cycles are common and our ancestors dealt with them just like we will have to deal with them and just like them we are unprepared. We will discuss um, traditional ecological knowledge um, and how it relates to western ecological knowledge or here referred to as scientific ecological knowledge and how those two systems can be integrated with one another to ensure that we are adapting to the climate change crisis in the ways that are best for all of us. Subsistence activities will refer to all traditional activities and customs which Alaska Natives participate in to gather and prepare food, make cultural clothing, create tools, and how they use these items in the various activities and traditional knowledge systems required to enable these activities and their survival. Using the lens of climatic and social conditions, we will endeavor to understand how that integration of TEK and SEK can translate to current stopgap measures for the anthropogenic climate change crisis of the 21st century. There is a path forward to a solution which considers all the accumulated knowledge of humanity without exploitation and extraction as the focus. So here's some important background knowledge. On the coast of Alaska, the conditions are variable and intense, with a food crisis that becomes more dire every year. Um, since ANCSA was enacted, uh, the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act in 1971, the right of Alaska Native people to participate in subsistence has been extinguished to pass that responsibility down to federal and state agencies. And as most uh, rural and some urban Alaska Natives diets rely on a subsistence lifestyle, this has changed the ways in which they can gain access to food and be food secure. In 1980, the passage of the uh, ANILCA, Alaska Na National Interest Lands Conservation Act, um, enshrined at the federal level a prioritization of rural residents' subsistence, but that did not translate to uh, Alaska Native subsistence, only rural. And the state was required to also put provisions in to protect this, but they did not do so, and so federal government took back control of federal lands in Alaska, like the Arctic Wildlife Refuge um, and other federal lands, um, and development projects have been increasingly introduced, such as the Willow Project and the Ambler Mining Project, um, as well as increased trawling off the coast and development of oil and gas on the North Slope, all of which are affecting subsistence um, and being affected by climate change. And so now we're going to go over uh, how we are differentiating traditional ecological knowledge from scientific ecological knowledge. They are very similar, but ultimately quite different in their, in, in their cores. Traditional ecological knowledge um, tends to be a more holistic way of viewing um, ecology and viewing the world. It's largely qualitative, um, though there are quantitative aspects of it, um, and it integrates a moral and ethical and spiritual view of humanity's place in the world and how they interact. That comes from a study in 2000 by Ford and Martinez, um, and they tend to function via long-term seasonal, decadal, and centennial timescales due to the nature of how that information is passed down by oral history um, and generation to generation, as opposed to scientific ecological knowledge, which is individualistic and reductionist. So it looks at one aspect of the ecosystem and how it relates to other things, but it does not look at the whole system and how that system relates with that individual. Um, it's largely quantitative as it seeks to understand that which is measurable with methods and tools available. That comes from an essay by Kimmerer from 2018. Um, and so that means it uses the scientific method and only those things which we are able to quantify as opposed to the moral, ethical, and spiritual uh, inclusions of traditional ecological knowledge. 
and scientific ecological knowledge also tends to function via short-term timescales just due to the nature of scientific research and the total research we have available to us, which we have not been doing for as long as traditional ecological knowledge has been getting uh, amassed. But both will be necessary for planning for the future to integrate um, policies and solutions which are effective for everyone. So we're going to go over just a small um, section on colonization's impacts. Um, since the first contact uh, with Euro-Americans between the 18th and 19th centuries, um, there has been a devaluation valuation and delegitimization of this knowledge. A perfect example of this is described in Ford's The Relevance of Indigenous Knowledge to Contemporary Sustainability, which describes a case of Inuit bowhead hunters. Due to the nature of bowhead hunting and the Inuit people's practices, they tend to go out further on the ice than climate scientists are able to. And so they are able to observe aspects of the Inuit, of the, excuse me, the bowhead whale population, which climate scientists would not have access to. They're viewing these animals in a very different way than we would. Um, and when faced with a declining whale population, the governmental and agencies which regulate bowhead hunting um, declined and dis to integrate and dismissed the knowledge which these Inuit bowhead hunters had accumulated um, when making wildlife management decisions. This was due to perceptions that the Inuit hunters were motivated by self-interest which is something that is antithetical to traditional Inuit beliefs of self-restraint and a view which directly contradicts data, as seen in that Ford essay. Um, the data showed that bowhead whale populations um, were of the populations within the world, only the Western population is harvested, and it's only this population which has bounced back from the excess harvesting of the 19th century by outside entities. And so a distorted reflection of indigenous value systems is often, like in this case, superimposed on top of the truth when governmental or institutional systems are seeking to exploit resources for themselves um, inter and interact with indigenous knowledge holders. We're now going to go over Alaska climate change impacts on Alaska Native communities. Instead of focusing on all the climate change impacts, we're specifically going to focus on ones which pertain to Alaska, which are characterized by increasing mean temperatures, increasing levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, melting permafrost, and changing habitat as the boreal forest moves north, and a dramatic retrenchment in sea ice coverage. That comes from a study by two, in 2007 from Callaway, which they also found that in the last 60 years, as of 2007, the surface temperatures of Alaska have seen an increase of 5 to 7 degrees. Destabilizing the land, changing access to water, um, as water and waterways provide food, water, and transportation, which is definitely going to affect subsistence in Alaska. Uh, one example that I reference um, is from an inter uh, a lecture which I received last semester um, from a Athabascan elder here in uh, Fairbanks. Uh, his name is Sam Dementif, um, and he is from the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta, specifically Holy Cross, Alaska. And he discussed how in the last three years, he had not consumed any salmon or been able to um, go out and do subsistence regarding salmon, due to the fact that um, increased trawling and climate change impacts have changed the populations of salmon to the degree that they have no access to them. And if they want to preserve them for future generations, they cannot participate in that subsistence that they have used to get by from year to year. This is not something which is uh, uncommon. Um, as we are seeing from the knowledge that we have gained about uh, the scientific ecological knowledge we've gained from reports like the, uh, from the I our IPCC, uh, global warming is going to be affecting soil moisture, participation, uh, and temperatures to the degree that over time we may be in a very different world than the one that we know today. And another example that I discuss um, is not necessarily related to subsistence, but is just related to being able to live in general. Um, one of the stu one of the studies I reference is from uh, is about Kivalina, 
Uh, climate change induced erosion, melting sea ice, and greater and greater storms for this coastal community, this island community, um, and when faced with the possibility of having to relocate or adapt to the problem, um, they were met with poor government response, including the hiring of private contractors, which eventually created a worse problem for them than they already had as their management decisions were not helpful and were in fact harmful. Their relocation efforts were stalled due to further pressure from the government and eventually a lawsuit against those private organizations proved ineffective and costly um, and essentially went nowhere. Uh, in general, um, traditional ecological knowledge is holistic and so this is a very important part of determining how exactly Alaska Native people are going to be able to adapt to the climate change crisis as storm surges become a bigger and bigger problem um, and people are having to relocate uh, more and more often. And so in many interactions that Alaska Native people have with these private and governmental organizations and entities, their systems of knowledge are attacked as irrational or devalued altogether, yet co-management remains one of the best avenues to a future wherein all aspects of ecosystems and peoples are considered in future adaptive measures to climate change. It is not an inherent characteristic of humanity to over-extract and exploit environments to the point of ecological collapse. Traditional ecological knowledge is just as important to the overall adapt adaptations that humanity must undertake over the next century as is scientific, scientific ecological knowledge. Further considerations must be made to include this knowledge in any future plans regarding the state of Alaska. Everyday sub but everyday subsistence is being challenged. Alaska Native people are having to fight um, for resources that become scarcer and more expensive. They are losing touch with their languages and their lands, and life is becoming harder in many ways. Yet, these people continue to persist. They fight for their language, they speak it every day that they can. They fight for their subsistence rights, and they fight for the rights of their families and descendants to exist in a world that they recognize. In this way, we as a greater com world community have something to learn and to begin practicing within our own systems. At the end of the day, we are, have very little control over these climate systems which have been amplified over centuries of industrialization and over consumption. We have no way of stopping some species from going extinct, from stopping storm surges, from stopping disease, weather, uh, and displacement at scales we haven't seen, but if we can, do this integration of traditional ecological knowledge and scientific ecological knowledge, we can live within a system of reci reciprocity and respect um, that takes into account all beings on Earth, human and non-human, um, and we can survive. Uh, just as the last Ice Age fundamentally shifted the climate and life on Earth, there will be a fundamental shift in the life as we know it due to this crisis. Um, but as scientists, we have this unique opportunity, um, and this is why I love anthropology so much, to integrate fields of knowledge that are very disparate, whether it's science being integrated with language, being integrated with cultural anthropology, being integrated with physics. There are so many different things that we can do to increase our knowledge systems and make our ability to adapt that much stronger. And so, the scientific ec ecological knowledge we have accumulated and the traditional ecological knowledge of Na Alaska Native and ind other indigenous knowledge holders are not wholly incompatible, so long as special care is taken to ensure a foundation of respect and reciprocity is at the heart of this effort, an integration of this magnitude can be done, though it will require an intensive and extensive social change, one which will fundamentally alter interactions we have with each other, with others, and with the land that provides all that we need to live. The honorable harvest is something we can all practice. Um, that specifically, that phrase is something which has been used over millennia, but I specifically refer to it from an essay by Kimmerer in, from 2018, wherein the honorable harvest um, is must be maintained for those harvesting to ensure sustainability. And we can bring that aspect to all aspects of our lives and integrate it with our scientific ecological knowledge so that we can adapt um, and be a more secure, more sustainable, and more respectful and reciprocal um, society. 
thank you so much. Um, I really enjoyed uh, this essay. Uh, writing it, and I really uh, hope to read everybody else's essays and learn about what you guys have learned this semester, um, as it was a very productive semester for myself and a very good class. So here are my citations, and I really appreciate you guys listening, and I hope you have a good rest of your day. Thanks so much.